The formula for power development. Rate of force development is one of the most important aspects in pretty much any sport you can think of, except for maybe chess. In every other sport, from boxing to rugby, fencing, swimming, you name it, rate of force development is king. The athlete who can either do the most amount of work in a given time frame, or the athlete who can produce the most amount of power, will often determine the winner, all other aspects being equal. Now, there is of course skill involved and it's a given, but when we've matched for skill, our ability to repeatedly and consistently produce a lot of movement with high force will inevitably give us the advantage in pretty much any sport. The development of power is a very interesting topic and one that is often misunderstood, misapplied and misprogrammed throughout many sports. I want you to imagine three different stages of an athlete's development when we're looking at appropriate programming to make that athlete more powerful. Stage one or phase one is general hypertrophy. Sometimes known as a base phase or a strength endurance phase, the main goal is to produce changes to the muscle architecture, aka you want to develop muscle tissue. Muscle tissue should be thought of as contractile tissue. It's the only one doing work. Yes, tendons attenuate the power from muscle contractions, but without the muscle tissue present, we're severely lacking the basic needs. In phase one, athletes will focus on two aspects. The first is higher rep compounds and isolation work. Generally, this will be between three and six sets of eight to 12 reps, depending on the exercise range. And the percentages of the athlete's max will be approximately 60 to 80%. The second area the athlete will work on is their work capacity. The high volume strength training will cover some of this area, but we want to ensure resilience against high training loads later in the phases. Work capacity training consists of high intensity cardiovascular work, like interval training, sprints, circuit training, sled drags, etc. Once we've accrued enough muscle and work capacity, phase one will finish, usually between four to eight weeks, depending on the time available to us. Phase two. Phase two is the development of maximum strength. Phase two is all about strength gains. High force development is the name of the game here. We want to push the athlete into 90% or slightly higher of their 1RMs for traditional heavy strength exercises. Phase two is all about utilizing this muscle that we've built from phase one. Athletes with the highest force capabilities are the ones with the highest potential to produce force across a variety of velocities. We can do a thought experiment to conceptualize this. If we imagine a sport where the goal is to deadlift 100 kilos the fastest, then if you imagine we have two athletes, John Hack and Elliot Kipchoge, the runner, competing in this competition. John Hack's ability to move this deadlift faster is of course never in doubt. John is easily going to move this 100 kilos faster than Elliot as his capacity to produce force far exceeds the runner. It's a basic premise, but the principle holds true when we scale to sports. The deadlift is the person's body and it represents them throwing a punch or running or throwing or resisting an object. Yes, the reality is more complicated in the analogy, but the point holds true. The athlete's job is to regain old 1RMs from previous off season or up to obtain new and improved 1RMs. This phase may last anywhere between six and eight weeks, depending on how long the athlete has. Here, the athlete will also continue to work on to hold the muscle. Now, let's take a look at phase three of our equation. This phase is one of two things. It's straight to our sport, or it's time to move to high power or high velocity training. This phase in the gym looks like jumps, sprints, quarter squats for speed, Olympic lifts, variations, plyos, cluster sets, etc. In this phase, we are utilizing the strength and muscle we built in phase one and two to become specific to rate of force development. The interesting thing here is that you can, if you're short on time, move straight to your sport to improve your rate of force development due to the fact that most sports, by their very nature, are highly explosive sports. All the way from running, throwing or grappling, we're using our body's explosive capabilities to complete the sport. The stronger and more muscle you have within some caveats like body weight and VO2 efficiency, the more likely you are to be more powerful and the more explosive at least. Now, it's more ideal if you can specifically train power in a well-controlled environment in the gym, but the sport itself can suffice. Now, let's talk about a couple of things that are commonly misapplied here. First of all, many athletes skip or complete phase two incorrectly. They either choose the wrong movements or forgo the act of increasing strength at all. Without this increase in strength, a well-trained athlete will not be able to improve on the rate of force development to a meaningful degree. In some gyms from some coaches around the world, we will see this notion that muscle and strength will make you slow and bound up. Chances are, if you're watching this video, you probably know that's an outdated notion. But if you watched a lot of the most expensive athletes training, you'd still think it exists. The exercises best chosen here are movements that complement the athlete well while allowing him or her to lift the heaviest load 
safely through a relatively full range of motion. So this looks like squats, presses, rows, weighted body weight movements are all great places to start. Things that don't really work as strength movements are TRX classes, BOSU ball goblet squats and isometric bicep curls. Dot dot dot. Big bang for your buck complemented with some nice auxiliary movements will take you a long way here. The second most common error is the desire to squash all the phases into one joint cluster phase. Here we often see athletes literally trying to train all areas in one circuit, not even in one week, literally in one training circuit, such as combining med ball slams with curls and box jumps. Problem with this is that we're essentially only training phase one here. We're likely getting some, but not much hypertrophy and really only training work capacity. In these large circuits, we never really get the opportunity to reach 80 to 90% loads, so we never really get into phase two. During these large circuits, the athletes' techers degrade and we're either risking injury or reinforcing bad technique for larger weights that we don't want. Now, when I think about anything related to performance, I always think what's the counter argument to this? For example, if we look at LeBron James or any other athlete who is piss weak in the gym, but still an all-star in their sport via skill and power development, how do we think about this? How do we rationalize this? First of all, we're s &C coaches. We can make you more powerful, but if you suck at the skill of your sport, then you're just gonna suck. Secondly, athletes who are managing here are freaks of nature and often improve in spite of, not because of. Coupled with this fact, a lot of elite athletes use a little bit of the forbidden sauce, which makes power development a lot easier. If you imagine all of these phases as floating boats in the water, and the water is your natural capabilities, if you add performance enhancing drugs, you're adding extra water and thus raising all of these boats, even if you don't train them directly. Lastly, there's a caveat to this. If you train from a young age, your ability to produce power is much more ingrained skill than if you start later. Athletes who begin earlier, coupled with athletes who are freaks, who are probably thinking of here, essentially have the capacity to repeatedly make gains on this phase three for decades. As they grow, their strength naturally increases, thus allowing them to increase the rate of force development via an indirect route of increasing strength via maturity. I believe that if these athletes had a better opportunity to train, then they would further still increase their power outputs. Now, whether that would make them better at their sport is up for debate, but for everyone else, it certainly doesn't hurt. So let's quickly recap our formula. Phase one, we build muscle and work capacity. Phase two, we use this muscle to build strength. The strength is very important because if we want to produce high levels of power, we need to be able to produce force at higher levels of our muscles ability, but we can't really build too much strength after a certain period if we don't build muscle after a certain time of training. So we need all of these phases. Phase one, build muscle. Phase two, build strength. Phase three, use that muscle and strength to be faster by specifically training it from the general capacities you have just trained. Now, I'm actually gonna advertise you two programs. Today's video is brought to you by two potentially different programs, depending where you are in your training. First of all, it's the Power Clean program or the Clean Up Your Clean program. This can be either done for your full clean or your power clean. It's eight weeks in length, two sessions per week, and includes all the variables you need to improve your power clean or your full clean. Second one I'm gonna bring you is a row to your squat program. If you need to increase your absolute strength levels via your squat, the row to your squat program is your one, two sessions per week, eight weeks in length. It's tough, but it will get you there.